Welcome to Old Guy Tech, the OGT.TV recording studio. Technology for the rest of us. 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 Hi, I'm Rob Charney, Old Guy Tech TV, and we're here today with Joe Hoffman running for Superior Court in El Dorado County, Office 7. We've had Joe here before, but we thought what a great time uh, to get him back in here and talk about the campaign and how's it going. And, and it's a lot of work, and uh, thank you for showing up again, oh, of course. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you. So how does, how's it going? How, how do you feel really as a well. candidate now? It's going really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely going really well. The primary went really like we expected and hoped. Right. Uh, now we're in a good spot to finish it out in the general election get it done good so it keeps you busy every day huh it does and, it's, and you're still working too I'm, I have my second full-time job as a lawyer is uh, going good too that's good that's, that's that's really good so um so why don't we go over again uh, what why don't we talk a little bit about qualifications what yeah. what are your qualifications for Superior Court judge well I've been a private practice attorney for the last 17 plus years uh, January will be 18 years uh, practicing primarily El Dorado County and Sacramento County hmm. Um, handled every, just about every facet, it seems, of civil law, uh, from employment law to personal injury to real estate to family law. Uh, I've done a little bit of juvenile work, uh, just a broad-based general civil practice. Uh, my law partner is my wife. Right. So that's been that makes a, it easy, a, huh? a fun process, absolutely, yeah. for the whole time, actually. So that's been great. Um, and so I think my broad-based experience in El Dorado County is what makes me qualified to be a judge here. Very good. That's great. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is I was trying to figure out how are, how are judges assigned the cases that they get? How, how does that process work? That process works in a county like ours. Uh, they call it a cow county, it's a rural county. Right. Uh, all the judges are cross-trained to be able to handle every kind of case. But you're usually given an assignment by the presiding judge okay. that assigns you a department. So currently, the department that I'm running for handles juvenile dependency, juvenile delinquency, and traffic matters. Oh, okay. Now, that doesn't mean in January that's still going to be the area of, of law that I would be assigned right. uh, when I'm on the bench. But that's the that's the best guess we have at this point as to where yeah. I'd be assigned. Now, the sitting judge now, is that what he's doing? That's what he's doing currently. Okay, that's so why I, I would since, step into that role. I see. Okay. Well, that would be good. Um, let's talk about judicial philosophy a little bit. Okay. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your philosophy and the position as judge? My belief is that the judge's responsibility is to listen to the facts, make their determination as to what the facts are, because each side is arguing their version of the facts. Make that determination, apply the law, and make a decision. It's not my job as a judge to legislate from the bench. It's not my job to do the lawyer's job. They do their job, putting the facts as they want them to be presented, before the judge. Right. My job is to judge credibility, make a determination as to the facts, and apply the law. Period. And the and the biggest part of that, which I gloss over, but is the biggest part, is to make the decision. Right. Be the decisions decisive. have to be decisive. So um what made you decide then, that you, you know, you've been an attorney for many 15 plus years, right? Correct. So why, what was it that made you decide you wanted to go to the next step to become a judge? I don't necessarily know that I ever believed it as the next step. Yeah. It was just, uh, it was something that was out there. It was something I always wanted to do mm -hmm. uh, just from an early age, even probably from if you go back to when I started law school. Right. Uh, that was always something that I thought I would enjoy. You never really know till you get a chance to do it, but judging isn't one of those things you get to dabble in often. Right. I've been fortunate that I've been able to be a pro tem judge okay. and also a private judge, and that cemented the fact that it was something I liked, something I was good at, and right. something I wanted to do. Expre explain the term pro tem. So a pro tem judge is a uh, essentially Latin for a temporary judge. Okay. You're assigned by the Superior Court to sit as a judge for that day. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, in my experience of being a pro tem, it's to help cases settle. Okay. Functioning to alleviate the burden on the trial courts by volunteering my time to try and help cases that should settle to settle. So do pro tem judges mostly sit on uh, cases that probably are short term, not a long term case? As example, uh, as recently as this morning, mm -hmm. uh, up through about 2 o'clock today, I was pro tem judge in Sacramento County on oh, the family okay. law calendar. Mm. So there are 
approximately 15 cases that are on calendar that are set for trial within the next 30 days sometime. Mm -hmm. And my job is to look at the facts, look at the briefs that the parties submit, and try and help them reach their resolution, all based on the fact that I have the experience to know that if you go to trial on this issue, here's the likely outcome. Okay. So why go through the expense and the time and the delay right. to get the outcome that you could get today? Okay. And it alleviates right. the burden on the courts. We do, I do it as a, a volunteer basis, so mm -hmm. I give up my time during, for today to go do that to try and help alleviate the burden on the court. Okay. Does, um, ha have you also worked as an arbitrator? I've worked as a private judge, which is, which is similar. Uh -huh. uh, a private judge is different in that, uh, as an example, El Dorado County will allow two attorneys or two parties even to stipulate to use a private judge. What they do, uh, and that stipulation gives me all the power as a sitting judge for that case. Mm -hmm. They then come in, and we may do it in my conference room or one of their conference rooms, and they present evidence just like they were in a trial. Okay. And then my job at the end is to, again, make, make a, a determination ruling. as to what I believe the facts are, apply the law, and make my ruling. Hmm. And they do that because a lot of times either there's uh, a lack of confidence in the expertise as the sitting judge on the bench. Right. Uh, a lot of times it's based upon the fact that there's a lot of time delays in the system right now because the system's overtaxed and you may get bumped and bumped and bumped. This allows them to pick a date. It's blocked off on everyone's calendar. You go in. It's the only case I'm dealing with for that day. They know they're going to get their case heard and they know they're going to get a decision. Good. So, uh, I'm sorry. And it's, a, it's one of the best experiences I've had uh, as a practicing lawyer. Uh, it's humbling because, generally speaking, it's two lawyers that I've been against right. that have mutually agreed that I'd be the best person to hear the case because of mm -hmm. my expertise and demeanor. And you mean they, they liked you? They liked me. It's, it's nice <laughs> Amazing. To, it's nice no. to be liked. You know? <laughs> and, and they trust that they're going to get a, a fair, right. well-thought decision. Right. right. And, and there's nothing more humbling than that yeah. when you do what I do. So. That's very nice. That's very nice. So, um, so. Yeah, I was going to talk about your trial experience, and I, I, I'm trying to remember back in our last interview, you, you talked. To, you, have, you have quite a bit of trial experience. I have a lot of courtroom experience, absolutely. Yeah. I've, uh, I've done jury trial. I've done a lot of bench trials, which is a trial by a judge. Uh, I've done a lot of law and motion practice, which is the kind of the shorter hearings. We need to go in. We need to get an answer for this one issue. It's not the whole case. It's just a piece or there's a dispute of whether the case should go forward or not go forward, those types of, of things that are, uh, they call them law in motion matters. And I've done a lot of those over the last 18 years in a variety of different areas of the law. Yeah, it gives you a lot of experience. Let me ask you a question on, you know, and we all watch these cop shows and television, and they're always looking for a judge to get a search warrant. Can you tell me the process of, of this on a search warrant? How, do, how does this actually work, and how does the judge make a decision to issue one or not? Okay, so my, my experience is not based in criminal law, so there's going to be a okay. steep learning curve when I get on the bench for the areas of criminal law, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm, I'm looking forward to, actually. I, I like that part of it. I like the learning curve process. My understanding of the process is when the, when the police be believe they have probable cause to get a warrant, mm -hmm. they bring their declaration of probable cause to the judge that's on duty, uh, and the judge makes a determination of whether there is or is not probable cause, and then if there is, they issue the search warrant. That's my understanding of it. Again, it okay. may be minimizing a little only because I don't have that specific experience in my background. So let's say you're, you're, you've are you been working as a defense attorney and somehow a search warrant situation has come up. Um, what would you be looking for in a search warrant that you might decide uh, should not have been issued? As a defense attorney? Yeah, yeah as a defense attorney. Uh, you're looking for any reason that it shouldn't be. I mean, as a defense well, attorney, sure, you're obviously that, But, what, you know, what are, you must have some, something that you really look for that... It'd be hard for me to say, only because yeah. I've just never practiced in that area okay. at this point. Okay. I just wondered, I always wondered how that worked, so I, I thought maybe we'd talk about that. So, You know, um, we always hear about backlogs, and, and I understand that we have quite a backlog in, in, in our uh, cases in El Dorado to be heard in Laurel County. Um, is this true? I mean, is, do we have a large back, backlog? And if we do, what can we do about that backlog? There is a large backlog, in my opinion. Uh, part of it is going to be beyond my control when I get on the bench because there's just more cases than there are judges to hear them. Sure. And that's just a, a fact that we're living with in today's world. We're not as bad as some other counties that are, I mean, San Francisco County is an example. 
is telling litigants that don't even expect to get to trial within five years because they've cut all these judges, they've done all these wow. things. And uh, my guess is there's a certain amount of posturing going on with budgets and courts. And no, all five that years, sort of that would probably be a nonviolent criminal thing. That's a right? non, that's a yeah, civil it's case. A civil case. Uh, yeah, okay, family yeah. law case or a civil case. Sure. The, the, what we can do about it, though, and one of the things that I'm looking forward to addressing when I'm there is, is figuring out ways to stop that backlog. Right. One of which is to be decisive. Right. Make the ruling when the case is presented, make your ruling as opposed to taking matters under submission or things like that, uh -huh. which then requires me to then do a written r ruling on that right. matter when I could just do it from the bench just and make my ruling. And the other part of that that I keep talking about is there's a certain element of consistency that I think is, is appropriate in the system. Now, everybody believes that their facts are different than any other case that's been out there, but the reality is there's a lot of cases that come up where, with similar fact patterns. Mm -hmm. And the lawyer's jobs are to try and differentiate their facts. But if at the end of the day, as a trial judge, if I believe the facts fit into this category of facts, and this is the law, then this should be the result. Okay. If next week a case comes back and the lawyers do their job to try and differentiate facts, but my conclusion at the end of that is, it's essentially the same set of facts as I had a week ago. Right. The law hasn't changed. Right. The results should be the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that makes common sense but it doesn't always happen that way. And when you start to be consistent with a given set of facts and the law hasn't changed, sure. litigants and attorneys you start to know, know what the outcome's going to be. Why should I go spend $10,000 to go to trial when I know this is the likely outcome? Right. Now, if the lawyer believes, "Hey, my facts are close, but they're not the same." That's a case that goes to trial because right. they have to explain to the court why their facts are different. And if I believe the facts are different, I'm not going to just apply it's not just a spreadsheet where you say, you know, A set of facts, B set of law, here's the result. Okay. My job is to differentiate what the facts are. Well, we do have a little bit of that, don't we? We have statutes. In other words, if somebody does armed robbery and you're convicted of that, you have to serve a minimum there are, sentence. There are certain mandatory sentencing that take place. Right. Uh, I have some difficulty when they start making mandatory things because mm -hmm. the whole reason you're hopefully voting for me or, or choosing me to be your judge as you respect my judgment. Right. And when you have it in a kind of a spreadsheet formula, mandatory guidelines, you're taking the judgment away, from, away from me. Yeah, yeah. But that's, so that seems, no, let's talk about then the, the strikes issues, the three strikes. And, I mean, um, how, how, how do you feel about that? I mean, what's... I, I think it was a good concept. I'm not sure it's being, it's being carried out in the best way. Mm. How, how so? Well, again, just the mandatoriness of certain things uh, eliminates the judgment ability by the court. And I have a hard time when judges are removed from the court. Gotcha. Okay. But what, what about a um, habitual offender, somebody that's, you know, doing it? I mean, I, think, I thought that the, this was really designed because you've got these people that are continuously always doing something that cause themselves to be arrested. And, you know, we go to the so-called three strikes, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, okay, now that you've shoplifted for your third time, you're going to spend 20 years in, in, in jail or, or whatever it may be. And is, wasn't that the idea behind three that strikes? Was, that was the general gist of the idea. Yeah. I just, I'm not so sure, because we all, we all hear the same story of the guy who, who steals a pack of gum right. and, and, and right. all of a sudden gets sent away for 20 years. Right. Is that the best use of the limited bed space, frankly, that's out there. Uh, it's the same reason we have a lot of these people where they're, you know, releasing nonviolent offenders back into the population. Mm -hmm. and, and I have a difficult time with that because the way I understand that to be is the definition may not be the same as what we think a nonviolent criminal is. Mm -hmm. So a person that had a violent crime one crime ago may get released on this, on this current charge as a nonviolent criminal, even though we would normally classify that person as a violent criminal. Mm -hmm. But when you start over, you start forcing people into a long-term prison sentence, um, you, have, you run the risk of then running out of space. Yeah, yeah. And then what do you do? Now, I absolutely believe that you have to be tough on crime. Don't, get, don't mistake what I'm saying. Right. But there's got to be some judgment exercised by the court. Yes. To make that determination. Well, I would think so, too. And, and then don't you see these, these individuals that are coming up on their third strike, they almost feel like they have nothing to lose at that point? It, my... Absolutely. Yeah. They're going to go to trial. Yeah. Because why would you not? 
So and and so they could actually probably do something even worse. They're going, hey, this is my third strike. I might as well go for the whatever. Potentially, and, but you asked about the backlog. Yeah, well, yeah. What creates backlog more than feeling like I have no choice but to go to trial? Right, right. Well, there you go. It's going to, I mean, yeah, if you have 10 strike, people that are all go. saying, may as well go to trial because yeah. my options aren't great. Yeah. You have 10 cases that are going to trial and there's no real chance of settling them. So how about, let's talk a little bit about the crowding in, in the jail system. I know we had the uh, realignment situation where... Um, some of the, the individuals that would normally go to, let's say, Folsom or Ione or Quentin or whatever, are being brought into the, a county jail. Um, does, does the judge or does a judge have any influence on that whatsoever? Uh, I don't believe they do. Yeah, I'm just I, I curious. I don't believe they do. That's, a, that's a, again, outside of my scope of expertise at this, minute, at this moment in time. Right. Uh, certainly will be more versed on it come January. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, but outside my scope. Right I'm now. just throwing, throwing things out yeah, because I don't I, know. I was just curious, you know, myself on, on, on what that was all about. So, okay, well, that's interesting now. Um, so, you know, I wrote some notes, and I, I one of the things I was talking about was, and we, you just touched on it, was the granting of continuances. Um, w what would you feel is a good cause for a continuance? See, I, I come at it from a different perspective than... Uh, what I've heard other people on the bench talk about with continuances. Mm -hmm. And I come at it from a different perspective than the public does. Because as a, as a party to an action, most of the time you want to get that case done and you don't like the fact that there's a continuance after continuance. I can tell you as a practicing attorney, there are a thousand and one reasons to continue a case. Mm. And a lot of what I believe, if both parties are represented by counsel and they, and they both have their attorneys, and the, both attorneys feel there's a need for a continuance. As long as it's not every every court hearing gets continued and we're bumping out for a year, right? I would give the attorneys which happens, the, which happens, uh, and that's kind of a chronic situation. And that's when the judge has to take control of the courtroom and say, "I'm going to give this last continuance, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Absent, you know, bleeding, right. we're, we're going forward next time." And the judge has the ability to do that. But more often than not, there's a there's a practical reason for that continuance when both attorneys request it. You kind of, as a judge, have to think, well, the attorneys know their case better than I do right. at this moment in time, and so I'm going to trust that they know the best way to handle their case. And a lot of times, as again, as a practicing attorney, I may know that if I continue this for 30 days, I have about a 95% chance in that 30 days I'm going to settle this case mm -hmm. because there's a certain fact that we're starting to get close to agreeing on, right. and if we just bump it, We'll get it done. Okay. It, it's not a delay tactic. Right. I mean, I guess it is, but it's delayed it for a purpose. It could be, but in this case, it might actually sol it, it'll, solve that it'll problem. It'll delay it right. for 30 days, but it'll ultimately take it off the court's calendar. That's right. a benefit to the judge. Right. And again, there's a, in, in my experience, there's a thousand reasons for a, a, a well-thought-out continuance, mm -hmm. not just delay. Mm -hmm. But as the judge, I get the luxury of saying enough is enough if I believe that it's just delay. Right. But at the initial start, I think I think my role will be to to give the lawyers the benefit of the doubt, especially in an agreement. Yeah. And if and if the lawyers come before me and say, "Hey, look, we think if we have 30 days, we can get this thing resolved," uh, there's no reason to force that case to trial, waste sure. the resources All of the, the court. All the money and time, and absolutely. When 30, you know, I'll take my chances that the lawyers are right, and they're going to settle their case because again, nobody knows their case better than they do at that right. point. Right. Right. They know it real good. Help me on uh, another term that I that I hear a lot, and I don't really understand. Uh, not being an attorney, is uh, disclosure of, I guess, evidence. Can, can you explain to me a little bit how it works on w both the uh, defendant side and the prosecution side on on what that actually means? Well, I'll, I could talk mostly in, in the form of a civil case, a plaintiff okay. and defendant, and the intent is not to be like it was on Perry Mason, where I surprise you on the day of trial with the magic document <laughs> that you've never right. seen before. Right. The intent is to have the cards on the table. So I get to ask you for documents. I get to ask you questions under oath. I get to do a deposition of, of, of oral questions under oath. And your job is to then respond to me. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, there's, there's ways for me to force that issue, to force you to respond or, or prevent you from presenting evidence on that when we get to a trial. Okay. So the whole point of the discovery statutes is to, is to get everything on the table so we're all working off the same facts. Right. Now, that's great in practice and in theory, but in, in reality, there's always some fact that you 
may not have been asked the right question, so you didn't disclose that okay. right answer. And okay. th there's always some of that goes on at trial. Um, it's just kind of the nature of that system. Right. But right. the intent is to get everything on the table, disclose it all, and if you still have a factual dispute or you still have a legal dispute, that's when you put it before the court. Mm. But the goal is, once we have everything on the table, two attorneys should be able to sit down and go, okay. Okay, we all have the same evidence. We, we have all, all the inf same information. So and, and we know these are the set of facts. Right. And, and I've practiced in this county for 18 years. I've had those set of facts before, and here's what the judge did. Right, right. Which goes back to my consistency point. Right. Why are we going to go through the trial when we all in the room know this what is the, probably what the, the outcome, outcome is going to be. Okay. And, and, you know, it may not be with 100% certainty that you know it's going to be X, but you know it's going to be between X and Y. Right. So now let's right. negotiate and get to a settlement that works for everyone or either works for everyone or e each party is equally upset that, by it. Right, right. Uh, and we but so during the, the, during the scope of the trial, however, some kind of disclosure could come out that, uh, that both parties weren't aware of until the the trial moves along, is that correct? Absolutely. There's yeah. always, like I say, there's always kind of a fact that we all expect it to be a certain way, and when the witness testifies, they testify different, different. than what you anticipated. Yeah. That's the, that's the training, I guess, that I believe gives me the experience to be on the bench, mm -hmm. is having been in a courtroom as frequently as I have, and a fact coming up that you just did not anticipate. Right. And you have to think on the fly, uh, you know, adjust and, and push forward without appearing like you have no clue that was coming. Right, right. Oh, that's okay. Well, that boy, that sure helped me a lot. I always wondered about it. Um, one of the things that uh, a lot of our attorneys in, in our community do is, is uh, pro bono work, and they, they do it for charities or w whatever. Could, could you explain to me exactly what pro bono means and what, if any, pro bono work that you have done? Sure. Pro bono essentially means uh, you're doing it at no cost to the client. Okay. I've, I, I started off with the intent of my pro bono work was going to be in the area of the pro tem judging. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy that the most. Uh, clearly, that's why I'm doing what sure. I'm doing now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I enjoy it the most, and I think it provides a great service to the court. I've also done some mediations for the court, okay. uh, which is where on the, on the shorter cause calendar in a family law department, Sacramento used to ask attorneys to come in and mediate a case. You know, the judge looked at the file, thought it was a case if there was an attorney with two people that were re self-represented, if there was an attorney to kind of help them through, right. they may be able to resolve that. So I've been asked when I've been in court before uh, in Sacramento to, to assist in that regard. Okay. But most of my pro bono work has been in the pro tem environment, mm -hmm. uh, volunteering my time to try and help settle cases, uh, get them off the court docket. I've done that in El Dorado and Sacramento for years. Again, to, to try to alleviate some of that congestion that we have in the courts. It, it's 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 pro bono, and it helps the litigants that are there, but it helps the system as a whole even more. Yeah. Because there's a lot of attorneys that do that. I'm not singling myself out. Oh, sure, out. no, a lot no. of attorneys that do that. Well, that's uh, what I mentioned. It seems to be a tradition, particularly in El Dorado County. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, uh, attorneys doing pro bono work. Yeah, and them. if you didn't have that, especially in the pro tem forum, mm -hmm. if you didn't have that, the system would grind to a halt. Yeah, I imagine so. Because every case would go to trial, and, and that Boy. would just bog the system down to no end. Right, right. How about that? So, um, so once you become a judge, and, and now you're a judge, um, what are you allowed to do in the counties as far as helping out of causes or joining groups or whatever? I know you have to be very impartial. You have to be very impartial, and, and you can still be active in organizations. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if I was active in an organization, an issue came up that was going to come before the court, I would mm -hmm. recuse myself and right. not be involved in that. Right. But absolutely, because not only do you have to be impartial, you, you should not do anything that even gives the appearance of impropriety. Mm -hmm. Even if there's none there, if it looks kind of, that's odd, you have to avoid that as well. Sure. And so as a judge, you have to be very, very careful with, with how, you, how you interact in those groups. Yeah. And I imagine the same thing would be paying dues to a group or whatever it may be. You're going to have to be very careful once you're a judge. Correct. You know, in that type of situation. So, so in some respects, it's good and it's bad, I guess. I don't know. Well, you can still be active. I mean, yeah. you can still be at events and you should be a member of the community. I right. Mean, I, I view right. the judge as a, a influential member of the community. And 
we see all too often where people get elected and then disappear. And you don't see them till the next election cycle. Exactly. And and I don't think that's right. I think I think as a member of the community, you should be fully invested as a member of the community. Mm -hmm. You should be at the community events. You should be visible. Uh, you should be accessible. Obviously, you're not going to walk up to me and talk to me about a case that's going on in my courtroom. Right. Right. But right. But you certainly should be able to walk up and say hello. Right. At a chili cook-off on Main Street. Yeah. That shouldn't yeah. be. Well, that doesn't off change limits. it. You know, we we can still be friends. You know, right. and, 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 and but just we're not going to talk about. Work, yeah, basically. You just, well, you don't talk about ongoing cases, yeah, but yeah. but so many people believe that you get elected and then you kind of you're up at a different level and you shouldn't go to those types of things yeah, because yeah. it gives you a wrong appearance. And I just think it's a community service element to that. that I'm, I'm glad to, to hear that. Yeah, because I, I know a number of people that have been elected and, and they disappear, and it's like. Well, you know, we can still be friends. We can still say hi. We can still talk about fishing, <laughs> whatever and, it may and, be. And I've been a member of, you know, the Chamber of Commerces and the Rotary Clubs since I've opened my office yeah. in 95. Yeah. Um, frankly, I would miss a lot of that. Yeah. I would miss the community involvement. I would miss being active. Sure. Uh, and if that was a situation, I would have probably rethought whether I wanted to do, to run for this office. Yeah. I thought yeah. that I couldn't be still yeah. a member of the community. I think that makes it better. You're more broad scope in the in the whole community situation you really know what's going on and i think that helps quite a bit let's talk about reform because that seems to be a, a, another hot topic quite a bit in 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 the judicial situations do you have any um well let's start this way as far as reforms do you have anything that you you would like to reform in our current court system i, I just think the the Population at large has to be considered in the process. And I say that, and that's not pointing fingers at anybody on the bench. It's just I, I think there's a tendency to forget that a lot of times litigants are there. This is the most important thing in their life. Right. They want to get, be, they want to be heard. They want to feel like the judge listened. They want to feel like they had a fair shake. And they want a, a decision made. And, and we don't often, I think litigants often feel that's not taking place. They feel, because it's crowded, that there's a certain element of a cattle call, there's a certain amount of mm -hmm. a rush through, mm -hmm. and that they, you, you hear a lot of times in the hallways that they don't even think the judge listened to them. Right. And, and it's not true, I'm certain. I'm certain the judges are listening. But if that's the perception, that's a problem. Right. And that needs to be addressed somehow by the judges on the bench to make it real clear that, you know, I am listening to your case, I'm, I'm weighing the facts, I'm being as deliberate as I can be, I'm being fair and neutral, and when I've made my determination, I'm going to tell you what that is. Yeah. I'm going to be decisive. Yeah. And as a litigant, one of the most frustrating things, and I could speak from the attorney perspective, is the delay between finishing putting on your case and sometimes getting a ruling 90 days later. Yeah. yeah. That's frustrating because now you're second guessing everything, the client's second guessing everything. They're wondering if they should have done this or could have done that. And, and I, most of the people would rather have the decision. Right. Make the call. Yeah, just do it. Yeah, because I know it would be terrible, in my perspective, to be hung out there for, you know, 30, 60, 90 days wondering what's going to happen. So I know I was talking to um, one of our current judges, and he said something to me that was just, inc I, I couldn't believe it. He says he actually, there are days where he has heard 30 to 40 cases in a day. And, and depending on the assignment, I mean, Judge well, Femister is an example. When you look at Judge Femister's calendar... He's hearing a lot of cases on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. But he gets through it because he knows the law. Right. He's, he's been there long enough that he's seen kind of a lot of the facts that come up and sure. a lot of the types of cases. He's been there, kind of done that. Yeah. And he's, and he's making decisions all the time. And when you have a judge that's as competent as Doug Femister, he can get through a calendar like that. Yeah, you, you would have to be because if you can't make a decision right then and there, the whole thing just gets totally backed up. Yeah. It's just amazing. You could I, see with 30 cases how easily it would be to be backed up. Oh, I know. It's incredible. Yeah, when he told me that, I was just, wow. I, I just have no idea how he does that. Then he still managed to come over for dinner. I was like, <laughs> I, I'd be asleep in bed at 6 o'clock <laughs> if I had to work that hard. Um, how about uh, how about what you would consider, what, what, what would you consider your best experience as an attorney? Uh, my best, you mean as far as the, have an outcome or yeah, just the thing either, I enjoy the best? The, the thing that you're the most proud of as an attorney. This is I think the thing I'm most proud of is actually doing the private judge work. Uh, again, it's because 
private attorneys that I've been against are selecting me because of my experience, because of my demeanor, because of my knowledge base, mm-hmm. um, and asking me, basically putting their case in my hands. And they have a free system to use. They have the court system, which they don't pay the judge to do it. The judge is there and right. paid by the state, right. and, and they put their case on. Right. This, they're actually advising their clients, it's worth the pay somebody their hourly rate to hear this case because what would be more cost effective in the long run because we want the delays right. and this guy knows what he's talking about and he's going to make a good, well thought out, reasoned decision. Yeah. yeah. It's extremely humbling and I say it and it sounds arrogant but it's, it is the thing I'm most proud of uh, because we've had some of the best attorneys in the county uh, utilize me as a private judge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, very, very humbling. That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, I want to I want to end this on a high note. So that's why I wanted to try to get, you know, what was your best experience and all that. And so uh, how many days in county do we have now? Uh, probably in the high 70s. I don't know for sure, <laughs> but probably 79, getting, 78, somewhere Getting around. ready, huh? You've been doing getting a lot ready. of shaking hands, kissing babies, rubber chicken. <laughs> we've, done, we've done about all of that. But, yeah. But it's worth it. I mean, we're... we're from my perspective, the more people I can meet, the better. Right. The more people that will watch this, the better. I all I all I ask for is an educated electorate. Right. Find out what's going on. Find out what's going on. If you believe that I'm the best choice, then hopefully you'll vote for me. And I think when you look, I mean, you have my website up in the back. When you look at the endorsements and that sort of thing, yeah. uh, you'll see kind of a pattern that takes place. Yeah. Uh, and I do believe I'm the best choice. I, you know. One of the things that's really neat for Old Guy Tech TV, is, you know, is being able to bring people like yourself in the studio and just talk. And it's just like you and I would be talking, you know, having a cup of coffee and, you know, just find out what things are and help people learn what terms mean. Because a lot of people don't know, you and I don't know some of this. And, and you brought that to us. And uh, I want to thank you very much for spending the time coming to Old Guy Tech TV, getting your face out there and getting the voter out there as well. Is anything you want to wrap up with? No, just get informed and, and vote. And vote. And it's November fifth, I believe. Yep. And get out there and vote. All right, that's the key. Excellent. Hey, I want to thank you for watching Old Guy Tech TV. This is Rob Charney. We'll see you soon. This episode of Old Guy Tech TV is brought to you by Ward's Automotive, specializing in Banks Power and Pack Brake, servicing your car or truck, and specializing in diesel engines. Over 30 years of service located in Diamond Springs, California. Give them a call at 530-626-5588.